Hello, this is my presentation on understanding man-made or anthropogenic global warming and the debate. Here's a list of various things that affect climate change in order of importance. And if you notice, man is only a partial influencer on, a, on the bottom two items. The Earth is mostly warmed by the sun, obviously, and 70% of the light is absorbed while 30% is reflected. Some of it is absorbed directly by Earth and other objects, and a little bit is, of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. The part that's absorbed by the atmosphere is what's called the greenhouse effect. Without the greenhouse effect, we'd be about 54 degrees cooler, but without the solar effect or solar forcing, we'd be about 500 degrees cooler. So it's about 10 times more significant. An interesting thing to note is that our neighboring planets happen to be warming at about the same rate we are. Now, since they don't have our SUVs and, and factories, it's unlikely that CO2 is causing that. There is an exception in that Uranus isn't, and a lot of the pro-anthropogenic types will all point to that as, oh, see, it can't be the sun. Only It's happening only 9 out of 10 times. But if you look at solar variation, it actually tracks the temperature much better than CO2 does, both in the 10,000-year cycle and in the more narrow cycles, like the uh, few hundred. Our atmosphere is basically made of 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, with this little sliver of other, 0.03%. And if you look at that, it's mostly carbon dioxide, but if you look at that, it's mostly man-made, about 97%. Man's responsible for just a small fraction of the carbon dioxide, and that's assuming that none is getting scrubbed out. If you break these down in fractions, they end up being very small numbers, 0.0%, or if you just look at how much carbon dioxide we've gone up over the last few hundred years, it's an even smaller number. Here's the IPCC's numbers for the scrubbing, or how much the, the Earth naturally takes out as far as carbon and puts in, and they tend to exaggerate man's contributions. If you notice on the left side of this bar graph that I've laid on its side, is this little red sliver that is the uh, all of man's output without factoring in lots of other things. So we're just not that, that major a contributor. And the bottom graph shows that sequestration, the majority of the sequestration happens in the oceans, 85%. Now, CO2 and temperature don't really map that well in the, in the short term. If we look at the 10-year cycle, we've been going down in temperature while trending up in CO2. So not a real good correlation there. If we look out a little further at the 150-year cycle, we actually started warming in the 1600s, but we started this trend in about the 1850s, and we warmed to the 1940s or so. The interesting thing is that's right when man started putting out significant amounts of CO2. A few factories and things before that weren't really relevant. So what you'll notice is that that right as man's output starts to go up, our temperature trends down for about 30 years, and this caused the global cooling scare in the 70s. And then it ramps up and down, and it's just not highly correlated yet. If we zoom out on the temperature sc scale even further, we look at the thousand-year cycle. This was the consensus of what temperature had done um, up till 1995. And it basically said, we know there's this medieval warm period. That's when Greenland was green and we were colonizing it. It's when they were growing wines in North China or North, uh, uh, North England, where we couldn't possibly do it today and so on. But it didn't fit the IPCC, which is a political arm of the UN that's meant to promote global warming. It didn't fit their agenda. So they used this man hockey stick that became famous. And what man did is... He took all this data and threw some others out and basically created this formula that showed how much it's ramped up at the end. The problem is it was really bad science. It wasn't peer-reviewed. He wouldn't make the data available for years. It underweighted some things. It overweighted others. It wouldn't factor in any of man's observations. And uh, some other scientists went and put multiple data sets through it. No matter what they put through, for some reason, their algorithms always showed a hockey stick. So it's been pretty discredited in the scientific community, but it's still used a lot by the um, political community. But if we keep zooming out and we get to the 50,000 year level, 
we start to we start to see this this correlation, and this is what Al Gore has shown in his uh, his video. What it what he never explained was that what happened in the past was always the temperature got warmer, and then two hundred to a thousand years later, CO two went up because as we warmed, the oceans released more CO two, and CO two followed. So CO2 has never been the cause of our warming in the past. It might have been a slight magnifier of it. But even this data is a little distorted because what they do is they twist the scales and they, they make the data fit. If you look at it in the data in its natural form, it would look more like this. Two parallel lines quite wide apart with just some little bumps that do look lightly related. But that doesn't fit the political agenda. But let's keep keep scaling out. Let's go to 65 million years and what do we see? We're actually at one of our all-time lows in temperature. Hmm. Let's go further. If we look at 500 million years, it's the same. We're near an all-time low in our temperature, not a high. This is not a big panic situation. And if we plot the temperature data over that time against the carbon dioxide trends, we see something very interesting. That data does not look very correlated at all. It's been much warmer with far less CO2, and it's been a little cooler with much more CO2. So CO2 can plot against temperature for a very brief amount of time if you scale them properly, but it doesn't hold over the trends. Another thing that people will try to scare you with is this whole water level thing. You know, oh, the oceans are going to rise, and Al Gore started his whole, it could rise 20 feet. Well, it's not going to rise 20 feet unless the Greenland ice shelf jumped out of the bowl surrounded by mountains it's in, jumped into the ocean, and started melting at about a thousand times the rate it currently is. He either didn't know that or he used politics um, or propaganda to get his message out. Scientific consensus is we're going to get about 3 to 18 inches of ocean rise over the next 100 years, which is not that big a fear. On top of it, that rise started in the 1850s. It's been going up about seven inches a year. It doesn't look like it's increasing. And it started 100 years before man put out lots of CO2. I don't think man was the cause. The glacier shrinkage, that started 150 years before man started putting out lots of CO2. Again, it's kind of hard to blame man for that. It doesn't stop some, but they try. What basically goes on is we have this science that's trying to create a computer program or a model that maps all these different environmental variables and can map our climate. So far they've done a really poor job. They can map a general trend in some short-term or mid-term windows for brief amounts of time if you twist and skew the data, but it doesn't hold up the further you go back or when you look at big pictures, and it doesn't hold particularly well when you look at the micro scale either. So it's still a work in progress. And then you have flamethrowers like Al Gore running around making $100 million off of, uh, off of his political agenda and telling everyone that you're a flat earther or a Holocaust denier if you don't agree with the scientific consensus. The irony is there's a lot of top scientists in their field that know a heck of a lot more than Al Gore that disagree. I guess they're all flat earthers. A top EPA scientist and top EPA analyst tried to come out the other day, but the Obama administration put politics over science and suppressed them. It didn't fit their political agenda. And if you look at other trends, if you look at polls of scientists and how many do, there is a soft consensus. You have about 80% of climatologists who make their money off promoting global warming fears that believe it exists. But that still means 20% don't. And when you start looking at geologists and meteorologists who study the environment as well, but don't have as direct a paycheck correlation, you get much lower numbers. You get more like 50-some percent or 60-some percent that believe in it, which is a pretty soft consensus. And when you look at those that, even if you look at all those that do believe in it, when you, uh, when you ask them, is there proof of that? It's a, much, it's a significantly smaller number. So you see this, these distributions of scientists that believe it or disagree with it, and basically every part of the theory is disputed in some form or another, or is being debated against. So the, the debate is not over, it's just beginning. 
Here's just some of the links and materials I used for this. I've been studying this off and on for like 10 years, just on the side. Um, I'm no expert, but the whole point of this is not that I'm trying to change people's minds on global warming. You can believe in CO2 causing Earth's warming or the tooth fairy for all I care. What I am trying to do is reframe the argument. You need to think about all the well-informed people that have very good scientific and logical reasons why they don't believe that man is the primary form forcing factor of this. Anyways, I hope this just gives you a different view and thank you very much for your time.